Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Movement Made Better podcast. We're back with our master instructor from the East Coast, Jared Forsteri. Welcome back, brother. Good to see you, man. Uh, great to see you guys, too. It's been, I can't believe it's been a year. It flew by. It was yesterday. It really. I, 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 yeah, man, I know you've been pretty busy. Yeah, the new gym. Just trying to get you know, some new, new clientele in there, trying to change some mindsets about, about fitness in this area, get some new, new athletes coming in. It's funny. I had a couple of new athletes that came in a couple months ago and I found out they were very hesitant to come in because they, you know, they, they saw what we did and it didn't look very challenging to them. And when they left, the dad said, like, they need to do this. They said, we have to do this, like sign us up right now. So it's good that we're changing the mindset a little bit on what sports performance is and how it should be done. So that's interesting. You said they didn't think it was going to be challenging, huh? Yeah, they came in because a few of their teammates come and uh, yeah, we use stick mobility. We, we don't use very uh, heavy loads a lot of the time. And these kids were used to power, I guess, powerlifting, you can say, but without it being actual powerlifting. But nonetheless, they came in and they were challenged. But again, like the things they do or the normal things that they do or, had, or did do didn't challenge the nervous system as much as we do. So that, I think that was the big missing piece in what their training was prior to that. Is there anything in the last year as far as something you've integrated in a little bit more? Any type of either a specific tool or some added nuance that you maybe use? Okay, you figured, you said, okay, this is really beneficial that you hadn't used quite as much or used it, not used at all? I'll say with, the, with our adult side, our programming went over the past, I'll say a couple months, like three or four months, we've done a lot of cardio strength mobility supersetting. So we'll give them their their strength work, whether we do like a let's say split squats. So if we do like some some rear foot elevated split squats, and then we'll have them superset that with some kind of high intensity cardio, whether it's a ski or or, or rower or whatever we do. And then like 30 seconds on, 10 seconds off, 30 seconds on. And then we have them go into say straddle stretch or whatever stretch would really emphasize the strength portion of that circuit and we've been getting some really good results with the members a they they love the format of the class and they're entertained or entertained um nice, nice. yeah not not my uh saying i believe i heard coach dose use that so if it, you know if someone hears hears this podcast and you know says that word coach dose he said it first so I, I heard it first but they're entertained and just how they feel like they, they, they're getting a lot more benefit from what we're doing. So uh, right now, so we're going to keep that going for a little bit. And with the athletes, I mean, just same old, same old, you know, like the, the greats are great because they do the, the simple things, you know, over and over again, you know, they don't make it too extravagant, you know, what works, they continue to do it. So we do our joint mobilizations. We do our standing hip series. Then we do our mini band activations. And then from Monday through Thursday, we do our normal progressive overload training. And then on Friday, we do our performance day. That's where I'll do like a lot of high volume of med ball work or, and we'll do our density work. So I'll give them six, you know, fundamental movements. We'll do a push, a pull, a hinge, a knee dominant, a core, and some form of conditioning. And I give them 20 to 25 minutes and they go as, Go through each movement as uh, as many rounds as they can, kind of like an AMRAP. But you know, we still have a high standard on what their movement quality is. And then when they're finished with that twenty or twenty five minutes, we go through a very intricate recovery. You know, for five minutes or eight minutes, whatever time is is left, we go through a lot of recovery. Well, as far as the recovery work goes, what are you typically doing? So we're doing a lot of simple mobility, uh, of course. We're also implementing a lot of breathing practices. One of the coaches at the gym is really heavily into breathing practice. So he's worked with me a little bit. So we'll do a lot of box breathing. We'll have their feet elevated so they can get the heart rate back down and get them more into that parasympathetic uh, state that you want to get them into before they head out the door. And then for a lot of the baseball guys, it's a lot of arm care work, a lot of long-term isometric stretches, 15%, 20%. Perceived exertion for 30 seconds up to a minute. So mm -hmm. that's kind of where our, our recovery stuff has been lately. Let me throw a question out to you. I had a kid reach out to me on Instagram, young kid. He probably looks like he's like 14, 15. Mm -hmm. Then he plays basketball. And then he said, uh, I want to increase my vertical. 
He's like, I, sh- I was thinking about using ankle weights to when he jumps. So yeah. how would you answer that kid's question? Then? If it, I, I mean, obviously he's, he's in a remote uh, place, right? He's not with me. I would probably steer him away from ankle weights. I would tell him, right? I mean, I will steer him away from ankle weights. I forget what the study was, but it was regarding vertical, vertical displacement, vertical leaps. And one of, if not like the best uh, carryover was, was kettlebell swings. And how it's kind of a swing. I mean, yeah, it's a hip hinge, but like your feet play a really big role in in the hinge pattern on the way up. I mean, and the hip extension. So one of the things I would give them definitely is is uh, is kettlebell swings, but also some skipping patterns, something where you're getting his uh, his ankle to, to dorsiflex at a fast rate. But also he needs to have that big toe extension, right? We talk we talk about it in certifications all the time for the uh, foot and ankle articulations, like. You know, we're trying to increase the range of motion that our, that our joints own and can work out of, but that big toe extension is super important for a sprinting and, and for jumping and for all overall performance. So big toe extension, working on that, making sure the ankle is strong and it has good plantar and dorsiflexion, and then just working on more triple extension stuff or quadruple extension stuff. But definitely I would have them work on kettlebell swings, like banded kettlebell swings, things like that. What would you say to uphill sprints? I like uphill sprints. We don't have many like areas around here that we can really do them at. So yeah. I don't have my athletes doing much, but it's not because I don't like them because they're not, I don't have the accessibility of the hill to do them. But I do like the force production that you get from doing the uphill sprints. Well, I thought what was interesting too was when in the question, he said, I've been seeing a lot of people use subscribe prescribing to the ankle weights to increase your vertical oh really yeah that's what he said in the que- in the message mm. and i kind of yeah, that's yeah, right? like if you're playing baseball and you have a fast pitcher you're gonna you know make the bat heavier right and then when the, the weight's off the bat feels lighter so if you do 10 jumps with ankle weights on and you take the weights off you're gonna feel lighter but it's gonna be a very short response you know it's not gonna be long lasting effects oh, yeah yeah, I think that's where the confusion is. I think people are thinking that that's going to carry over for two weeks from now. And right. You know, I mean, when I was playing basketball, the big thing was the strength shoes. Mm-hmm. Like yes. walking and playing and jumping and running on your tippy toes the entire time. And yeah, it's going to develop a bigger calf muscle, but it's not going to help you work on force production, you know, mm-hmm. the proper way and, um, and loading. So it's it kind of, it's in that kind of same school, right? Like ankle weights. Yeah. If, if I jump 10 times with them on and take them off, I'll get maybe one or two inches higher, but that's not going to help me in uh, a combine setting, you know, doing a vertical leap because they're not going to allow me to use ankle weights for, uh, first and then go do it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Especially if you're talking about, you want the ability just to come in cold and, right. just, and then hit that right. vertical. Right. So what is your ready state capability? What are you able to do without at a moment's notice without any warm up or prep? Yeah. Oh, you saw that you saw that video of uh, Zion when he was cold, right? And his yeah. vertical leap was just 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 off the charts, just cold. No warm up at all. Just come in and boom. Yeah. And then watching Ryan's expression when he saw that, he was all like, Oh <laughs> yeah, he was just super impressed when he saw that. Yeah, man, I, I'm I'm happy to see him performing at the same level that he has been this year. You know, with knock on wood, right? He's he's pretty injury free right now, so it's it's, it's always amazing to watch him play. Yeah. Things in basketball are are few and far between. Well, a guy his size too, with that much mass, he got to be what two seventy, two eighty. Good luck boxing him out. I think so. And he's not. That t- I mean, for the NBA, he's not that tall. Right? He's not he's, that tall. That's like the thing. Six six, right? Yeah, six, he's not. Seven, yeah. Right there. And then watch him step back and sh- and put up a three pointer too. And that's pretty impressive. Sure. Yeah. Ball handling's on so much better. Also, you know, he he he's turning into a, a full package. Yeah, I thought that was just with the with kids' question. The way he phrased, that I thought was interesting because I, I we still have so many kind of I guess misconceptions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that are just so prevalent that we kind of don't we don't think about it. Well, also, you know, I, I don't think there's enough information about the kid to really yeah. give him a good answer. Good answer, right? Because like, I don't well, know who he is. I don't where know where you at. You know, we yeah. don't know where you're at. Maybe he's at a level. If he maybe he moves really really well. Maybe we can load him with a seven to ten pound vest and do everything with that. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he'll get big gains that way. But if mm-hmm. he moves like shit, then the ankle weights are just going to, you know, compound that. Yeah. Because I, I think the first thing I want to look at is what are your feet doing in the first place? Right. You know, I've talked about big toe extension. Let's get you your feet. Let's see what your ground force reaction capabilities are in the first place. Yeah. I mean, if, if he has weak feet, he's not going to be able to jump that much higher anyway. Let's be honest, right? I mean, he has to make sure he has, you know, a strong arch, good big toe extension, like you were saying. But for like vertical leap training, instead of using the vest or even the ankle weights in, in, in this case, I like using bands. I like the, the setup where you have those two anchors uh, across the shoulder, right? Because you're also now working deceleration forces and how fast can you quickly get back up, right? The, the, the vertical leap, again, like it's a big test for athleticism and, and, and the combine, but I want to know, like, I want to see how fast or how high a player can jump after coming down from a jump already, you know, that's something that to uh, take a look at as well. You know, it's, you know, what's his reaction force time? He, he jumps, comes down. How high can he get now off that second jump? Yeah, especially in basketball, because, you know, if you're talking rebounding, you may mm-hmm. the first rebound, come back down, and then the ball is still free. So you got to be able to react again and, and drive back up. Do you lose vertical on that second jump? If you lose an inch to two inches, could be the difference between you getting the ball or not getting the ball in that case. Right. Or if you're or if it's an offensive rebound, it could be the difference between you getting the rebound and scoring, or you get the rebound and getting blocked. It's, yeah. it's, right? It's it's those game situations that we train for, we train the athletes for, but there's still a population of coaches that are are missing that little piece. You know, and that's why, you know, we're, we're, we're here talking about it and, and trying to spread the message. Do you have any of the, uh, the testing equipment to do that? We don't. I, I don't actually. A, because as you guys know, we moved into a new space. So trying to keep the, uh, the costs a little bit lower. So a couple of things that I did purchase recently was a 10 foot slide board because the eight foot ones that we have, our athletes, uh, our stronger athletes, they're already at the end of the board after they push off. So I had to get a bigger one. True farm treadmill, just to get the kids uh, to work on sprinting mechanics, sprinting in general, right? Because I mean, we only have 2,100 square feet, so there's not much room to sprint. So that gives us the option to do that. And it's honestly pretty much it. So I'm trying to keep the, the cost at, uh, you know, low, but as far as the like, vert testing stuff, I think the mat is really good because it takes up the least amount of space. And if you have enough space for the wall, I think that the the, the ruler up on the wall on the walls uh, are pretty good one too. They have these; uh, they're called G flight monitors. Have you seen that? You just put them on the ground. I have, you're yeah, yeah. And, I, and I did think about, or want, I do want to get them. I completely forgot about them, so you just brought them up. Yeah, that, that's uh, strong by science, right? That's where he uses them. Sure who the like? Who makes it? Hmm. But I did see. Uh, I seen. Uh, they're not too expensive. I don't think they're probably like four or five dollars. Oh, maybe pretty, maybe less than that. That's pretty reasonable. Yeah, that's a lot yeah. cheaper than a force plate. Oh, that's that's sure. Yeah, force plates are. Just... Yeah, so I, I do know those. I do want a set of those. Sure, I'll get them. But I'll tell you what, I haven't had an athlete really come in yet saying that you know we need to get my vertical my, my vertical jump higher yet. I have in the past, but since being here, I uh, haven't. And once that happens, I'm definitely going to go out and buy it. Others. but until then trying to save as much money as possible sure well yeah because that's the big that's the such the the uh the downside for a lot of these pieces of equipment or tools that are really beneficial but the price points are just you know as, yeah. a, as a business owner you're like do i want to spend two thousand three thousand dollars on this versus directing that money to other tools where i could get eight or nine different other tools yeah you know, just and so is the reward going to be worth that money that I'm shelling out? It's funny because even that musher that we just got, that's not cheap. Not yeah, cool. dude, that thing was with, with the conversion because it's from England. With the conversion, it's like 400 freaking dollars. Yeah. And, and I got me like, I mean, I told you, like, the price point's way too high, in my opinion, for what yeah. it is. You know, it's great. Love the tool. But yeah. man, tell somebody to spend 400 bucks on that thing. They're going to be like, uh, I don't think so. Right. And then, like, there's ways to do, like, I, I know I've seen you use the stability ball with the band and you get the same, the same, well, the same effects out of it, but it is better to do it with the tool, you know, but to your point, you know, yeah, it, it's hard to justify that price for just using it for that one thing. 
Yeah, the one thing I really like about it is besides the compressional force that you have to acquire, you have to acquire with that, is the track. It does force you to be more precise with your movement Mm -hmm. versus, you know, that randomness that you might get. So it does with that track and you want that band, that cable or that resistance to follow that track. It does make you much more mindful of your movement and what you're doing. That's cool. That is cool. I definitely have to, uh, to get my hands on one. I gotta see if someone around here has it, just so I can see it first before I, you know, before I get it. So, but I hope so. I hope I can get my my hands on one, test it out. You know, I think one of the other things you can do too, like just to say you don't have the equipment, is you can connect with someone around you that may have all that all the equipment, the force plates, the jumping sensors, all that stuff, and then just have your athlete, hey, go go see him for some testing. And then, you know, come back and we'll do the training here. And then you can go retest over there. Since it's something you're probably not going to test every session, right? You know, it's something that you just do, you know, periodically every six to eight weeks or something like that. You're right. And that's, uh, that's a point that, you know, for, for quite some time trying to convey to a lot of the other coaches is, you know, like check the egos to the door. Like we're all, we're all here for the same purpose. We're all here trying to do the same thing and, and help these athletes and the gen pop too is but in whatever way we can. If you have the the equipment to test my athlete, you know, we'll do the testing there. But yeah, and then if if you need something from me, I'll I'll do the favor as well. And sometimes it's it's kind of hard, almost like pulling teeth, talking to other coaches, you know, because let's face it, like there are you know those people that they they know it all or 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 they're the only ones that know the answers. And I in no way believe that I know all the answers, but I do know a lot of people that know a lot of answers. So I, I, I'm, I'm blessed that I was able to, you know, surround myself in my circle with people that I know are much smarter than I am that I can refer to for certain things. And then I can relate that to, to my athletes or my uh, adult clients. Do you, uh, have you gotten any kickback? Or, I mean, are any butting heads from your athletes, the coaches working with your athletes in the school or in their program? Not yet, but as far as to like, like what what point, like what, what kickback might anything, right? Yeah, like some people, you know, some coaches might be like, "Oh, he's wasting your time with that," or you know, "You should be doing more of this." And I mean, I'm assuming you're at some level, you're getting some. The athletes may not, you know, they they're going to get some of that, right? Definitely, and I also I also get it from some of the parents, not as far as kickback, oh. but some parents so like, "Hey, like." You know, uh, can we do this today? Make sure we do this. And I'm like, I know, like, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, or like, you know, the, the the best is when a parent comes in and shows me some other trainer's Instagram, and say, like, oh, I want my kid, I want him to do this today. I'm like, yeah, we we literally already do that. We just don't do that. Like, what, what this is is training. What the benefit is in this video that he's trying to accomplish. We already do that here, and it's a little bit safer. It's you know, but yeah, the, some of the coaches, you know, because they see what we do and in my Instagram feed, and and sometimes they you know tell their their athletes that they need to be lifting heavier or they need to be doing this, that, or the other thing. And I take it with a grain of salt, and mm-hmm. uh, I tell them, yeah, you know, no worry. And I, I'll talk to them and tell them exactly you know why we're doing certain things, and he understands. And I'm like, listen, if, if your athlete doesn't perform this season. And then come to me and and tell them not to come back or you know whatever the case may be or we'll do it differently. But until then, all right now, all the college guys that I had in the off season, they're all performing incredibly well. We must not be doing. We must be doing something right. So sure. Yeah, yeah. and yeah, after crushing their performance tests that they need to do, and then nothing needs to be changed. Well, that's the funny thing with the performance tests? I used to have a, an athlete who played football at Susquehanna and. He was a linebacker, so he basically just tested back squat, cleans, hand cleans, uh, back squat, hand cleans, and I think bench press. What we what we do, what we've always done is we do a, our bench press is dumbbell bench press. We do we don't we don't back squat a because I just don't think that all there's a very small population that has a very good body weight squat, and if it's not a good body weight squat, I'm not going to load. The spine at all. So, um, but even before that, like split squat, that's, we do a ton of different variations of split squats. So we're very unilateral uh, loaded here. Um, and then cleans, we use a lot of the sandbag. So try to, you know, work more like rate, more speed of the bag, that kind of stuff. So 
we hammered all that stuff in the off season. I just put them underneath a, a barbell like two weeks before going back to school. So we can kind of get used to that skill again. Uh, and then he, they, they, he always went back with increasing his numbers. He always increased his numbers going from the training that we were doing to his tests at school without doing back squats the whole entire off season, without doing hand cleans the whole entire off season and without doing barbell bench press the entire off season. He always increases numbers. With the proliferation, especially as institutionalized as back squatting is for let's say the last what, four or five decades. You actually think that that's really created more issues for a lot of our athletes than it is benefits. It's hard to say, man. Right. Yeah. It's hard to say. Yeah. yeah it's hard to say. I mean, I do like the safety bar. I'll say that. I feel much better. I think for me, because I had those two shoulder surgeries, mm-hmm. that external rotation position for me like is very uncomfortable. So yeah. that being so uncomfortable, I can't focus at all down here because my mind is like, you know, this is this doesn't feel safe for me. So mm-hmm. the safety bar my, it improves my squat instantly with that bar because I'm much more comfortable up top. So that could be a big thing, especially in, in overhead athletes, you know, is uh, if you're going to have them squat, you know, actually loaded, then use a safety bar, I would say, in, in my opinion, if you're going to do it. Yeah, because like you had just inferred just a few minutes ago, very few people have a, a lot of people don't have a really good body weight squat. Right. Blown. Okay, now let's throw some load on top of that. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's interesting because, it, it, you know, you sit here, at least for me, I kind of sit here back and think to myself, well, if, if your quality of body weight squat is piss poor, not optimal, right. then, then you have no idea core wise what the hell you're doing when you put weight on you. Right. And then, I mean, of course, we're, we're trying to get the athletes as, as strong as we can, but of course, as safely as we can. So if their body weight squat is optimal, we'll do a few, like one or two correctives before we, we get them into their you know, training sets. But I have no problem going like heavier on a goblet squat, mm-hmm. you know, still loading them, you know, really loading them and challenging them. But it's just, you know, which, which squat is going to be better for this individual person? You know, is it this squat that the risk reward ratio is a little bit more risk, a little less reward, or is it, you know, this one here that I know he's going to be safe there. And it might actually improve his posture in the squat, but we can still go a little bit heavier. So I'm not going to go toward a heavier goblet squat than, than a back squat, in my opinion. What about uh, front-loaded barbell squats? I like the straps. Uh, for me, I always had trouble balancing it on my shoulders, but I have my athletes do front squat, yeah. Because, again, it just helps them get more thoracic extension in the squat. So I think it helps their, their posture. But I like front squat. I've looked in the research and, and some some studies. There's not a big difference in what muscles are activated in a front squat and the back squat. Yeah, there's a little different, but like they're not drastically different to where you're not going to benefit from a front squat like you would a back squat. It, it just it, it isn't that different. So yeah, front squat for me. If and a lot of my athletes do the the cross hold, the shoulder hold at school, and a lot of them are comfortable in that way. So I let them. I let them do it. If they need the strap, they'll use straps. If they have the wrist and the lat mobility to hold their front loaded, we'll let them do that as well. But again, like we don't really use too much barbell work only because I only have three barbells and we can have you know eight to ten athletes in a class or a group. So it makes it hard to use it. Are you doing a lot of landmine work with your athletes? We are. Yeah. Yeah. We do a lot of landmine work. We do a lot of the standing rotational work, a lot of overhead pressing, RDL work. I like doing the RDL work on the landmine. Do a lot of the squat work. I like doing the landmine squats at the chest. And then I have them get into that ankle dorsiflexion at the very end. So I have them extend onto their big toe as they drive up into that squat just to get that quadruple extension like we're talking about with the big toe, ankle, knee, hip. I like doing that a lot. Then lunges, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll try to mix in a lot of landmine work, at least like two, two days out of the week. Yeah, the landmine's great, man. You ever do it where you rack it on your shoulder and then squat? So you're kind of squatting in this like more diagonal vector right. and you can, you can keep your heels off the ground and build a little bit of ankle stiffness too. Yeah, I'm going to start working a little more with that. I've been looking at it in... I've always had it in my head to try it. I keep thinking 
I feel like I have like I have maybe soft arms because Zercher squats just bother the. Head. <laughs> <laughs> I just look at them like it's gonna hurt my trap. Like it's gonna. I, 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 I gotta, I, I gotta bite the bullet and, and just, just do it. Um, <laughs> but another reason why I love the landmine, you guys know this. When we go over those partner stick pushes and pulls, and you know, if they can't get the arm, the bicep and the ear in line, we tell them that whatever their arm angle is, we want to pull in that direction of the arm angle, just so we don't jeopardize the rotator cuff. But when we're doing our either half kneeling presses, overhead presses, standing, whatever it is, if I see someone can't get that bicep and ear in line, their presses come a little bit more in front of the shoulder. I'm going to throw them right in the landmine because that's the position that they're going to be in. They're strong there already. I'll put them there and then they'll be much safer. But if they have trouble getting the dumbbell or kettlebell, whatever we're pressing overhead, I'll, I'll bring them to a landmine and, you know, I'll see like their lumbar spine looks much better in the press because they're not compensating to get there. Uh, and also they, they feel much stronger doing that press. If you have someone that's having actually some issues using a long bar, do you typically shorten, go down to more of a training bar size? Yeah. Okay. yeah cause, I mean, with, 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 with what we do, right? The, the six, like le- the lever system makes a really big difference. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We will almost all the time do that unless, or, or just take them out of that environment altogether and give them something else. Yeah, because I think that's that is such an easy thing to adjust, but I don't think a lot of people think about that. Traditional barbell, if you're having issues fighting rotation or resisting so, that, yeah. then just go with a training bar on the landmine, right? Well, even if you're stand, even if you're backloaded on the squat, right? If the lever, the longer yeah. lever, may just be too much. Short the lever, you may see a cleaner form. Yeah. So you could right. end up doing that, especially for people that have a lot of back issues. In the lumbar spine, and the coach still insists on, yeah, on, on actually loading them with that barbell. Well, and then if you're working with you know your adult classes, a lot of people can't start with the the 20 kilogram barbell, yeah, for landmine work, you know, for sure. Because I know I know we have two of the perform better bars, and they're actually a little bit thicker, the Olympic bars, so they, they do feel a little bit heavier, they feel a little more bulky. So yeah, like even without any any plates on it. It still is a little bit too heavy, so in that case, you just bring them to a different overhead modality than than the landmine because it it can be too heavy for for some populations. Yeah, totally. You know, in your adult classes, you're talking about you're mixing you know, a circuit of strength and then mobility. Oh no, strength, some cardio, and then mobility. Yeah. So you know, what are the time blocks in those? You know, they they have their set of strength, however long that takes, and then. And then you said they're doing like a little cardio burst and then the mobility section. Um, you know, you're yeah, so our, um, d- d- depending on which week it is. So like we, we alternate within hypertrophy, power, and then endurance week. So depending on what week it is, we'll dictate the rep count. And then most of the time, because we do groups, we try to format into like mini densities. So like 10 minutes or whatever it is for that particular day. And then if it's a strength week, we'll do 10 to 12 reps. If it's a power week, we'll do six to eight, keep it lower. And then if it's endurance, we'll go from 12 to 15. And then same thing kind of carries over for the, uh, for the cardio. So for the cardio, if it's a power week, we'll go like six seconds hard uh, or 10 seconds, six to 10 seconds high intensity. The endurance will go more like maybe like a minute. So we'll do a longer duration. Obviously, the intensity is going to be much lower, shorter intensities or start uh, shorter uh, durations, higher intensities. The recovery they have normally stays within between 20 or 30 seconds. And that's only dependent on the amount of time they have in that block, you know, because we understand that they're here to train, not to just stretch. If they want to do that, they would be at a yoga class. So we understand that, but we do know that they still need this stimulus. So we don't want to spend too much time in the circuits themselves on it. 20 to 30 seconds of a good stretch with 40 to 50% perceived exertion usually is pretty good for them. And then we'll do some more of it at the end of class. So then are you phasing like, so the strength week is, is this a four week deal? And then the, the, we, all, uh, we, I, I, I did try doing more of that kind of format where 
like three or four weeks of strength and then three or four weeks of power, but a lot of members got bored at it. So we change every week. Like this week, we're back on, on strength, hypertrophy. So right now we're about like 10 to 12 reps with our main blocks, our main workouts. So this whole week we'll do 10 to 12 reps. And then next week we'll go down to six to eight. And then the week after that, we'll go up to 12, 15. Yeah, because I think what's interesting, like what you just inferred, uh, what Jared just inferred is with a lot of general population, they they want that variety. Yeah. But if you give them four weeks of the same shit, it just becomes really mundane for them. And they're kind of, ment- especially mentally, they're already checked out. The amount of times I, I, get, I get asked how many reps, how many sets, or just what are we doing? <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> It happened this morning. I mean, it happens every morning. Yeah. It, what are we doing? How many reps and how many sets? Oh my God, I just went over it like a minute ago. But <laughs> it happens. And listen, like the gym for them, yeah, like they're there to obviously like get better themselves. But, you know, a lot of it, they have friends in that class and it's a little bit of a social hour. Mm-hmm. And I get it. It's, it's part of the service. You know, it, it's part of what we do. They, they make friends at the gym and, and they want to talk about, you know, sometimes they haven't seen them for a week. So they want to catch up and, and find out what they did over the week. And I get it. And I know it, you know, after doing eight years, like if, if you're going to try and keep the, the, the adult class quiet, you're wasting your time. It's not going to happen, you know, and you guys know. So listen, like, if they ask just... Yeah, yeah, we're doing you know half a million landline presses. It's ten per side, and then you move over here. It's the old adage. You know, if you, I saw clients. You know, if you spent, if you took all that caloric energy expenditure that you that you take yapping and transferred that <laughs> to over actually training, you'd be doing much better. Yeah, because you're like, you just see how people are just talking. And what's funny is you're like, you're like, you can talk and exercise at the same time. <laughs> Multitask. Just telling to breathe through the nose, right? Yeah. Just, just, just don't talk. What in the two minutes that I'm explaining it? Afterward, you can have a you can do your own podcast within the workout. <laughs> just, just, just for two minutes, just, just watch what I'm doing, and then <laughs> from there, it's, it's whatever you want to do. It's your world. Is there any like trend that you're seeing that's coming up? Is that maybe people aren't caught on to yet, or anything that you see changing? Either, either training style wise or business wise. Well, the big trend right now that I'm seeing is Ben Patrick, right? And uh, uh, you know, knees over toes from like, all the athletes now. Some of the college athletes that, that I have are, are sending me like some some videos of him and like your your knee can go past your toe and it can and it can help like benefit performance. I'm like, well, yeah, you know, like, if if your knee is designed to or any joint, if if it's designed to Go into a certain range of motion. Like, why? Then why wouldn't you, you know, put it there? Why wouldn't you train like that? Because you you might need that. You might need it at a random point in time during competition. And if you're not ready for for that position, then you're likely to get injured there. You know, it's like we always say. Like, we're always going to regret not training in the position that we got injured in. So, you know, it goes back to that. But right now, that's the biggest. Trend that I'm really seeing, and then business-wise, man, I'm just I'm, I'm always trying to find the the next trend. I'm I'm doing a challenge in April right now. It's like a partner challenge, so it's got to be one member, and they have to get somebody who's not a member to do it. Oh, okay. So it, it requires my zone, uh, the heart monitors. So I'm doing that right now. I have 12 signed up. So technically, there's there's six people that are new that are a part of the uh, part of the gym, but also there's the referral program. So our, our referral program is if you get somebody to sign up for a membership, you get a free month. So anybody who gets a partner and then the partner signs up, you know, they can get a free month out of it. So hoping that picks up and, and does well for me. The referrals are always better than the cold calls or those yeah. cold clients. People spent in our industry spend so much time and effort trying to get new business when you're like your clients are your perfect advertising like the referrals they've already sold you yeah right and, and i think i forgot who i said it to one time but we, we were talking about this same same topic and the thing with the referrals is somebody who trusts you with their life right i mean let's be honest you know 
with their life is telling somebody else that trusts them that this person is the person that you need to see to lose weight, to move better, to be stronger, whatever it is that they, their goal is, right? The person that, that you've been training, they trust you, that person trusts them. So when that person tells that person, go to this guy, there's already trust made, right? It's a triangle. You have the member, you, and then their friend. And they make that connection. They instantly trust you because they were told by that person, I trust him for however many years I've been going to him. He's the person. So I think that's why referrals work so well. Then cold calls. I'm, I'm listening to a book called Exactly What to Say. And basically, it's a 15-step approach on how to impact and motivate somebody to say yes. I've listened to it once already. A lot of really good points were made in the book. I have to watch it again, but with the notebook and, and really, you know, you're supposed to listen to it with a uh, pen and paper so you can write down all the stuff. But first time I listen to it, I just listen to it straight through. It's like an hour long. It's not, it's not too long of a book. I do well with audio books. That's why I went with audio books. Yeah, I have to go pen, paper, and really write down each individual step. It, it's basically in a conversation format. And it's, when I listened to it the first time, it was really good. I had to go through it again. And, uh, Hopefully they'll get better with, with those cold calls. I've done pretty good though. You know, we have eight new members. So something's gotta be done right. But once they're in, like I have a couple members always comment on posts. Like they love they love the gym. They love the environment. They love the community. They love like what we stand for. So that's now like they they can start doing the referral stuff, right? They can start telling their friend, I love this gym, I love the trainers, you know, you need to try it. And then you make that that trust connection. So hopefully that happens. But cold calls are always the tougher ones to get. And then the referrals are always instant. Exactly. Yeah. Because they know what they're getting into already. Or should have some preliminary idea of what they're getting, what they're going to experience or get into. Exactly. And the, the, the referrals are no more prevalent than with the athletes. It's incredible. Like one one athlete who who likes the, the, the sessions. Their parents tell for their friends' parents. And that's why our athletes have done so well as far as like getting more strictly on referrals. There's some athletes that I've gotten just from using social media and, you know, reaching out, bring a trial session, then we'll get them in. They'll, they'll, they'll see the other athletes. They'll have that little competitive fire and they see the high importance of like mobility that we have and, 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 and use of that. And they see the benefit in how it can help them in their performance. Some of them go to two gyms. Some of them go to me and some of them go to bigger other like, you know, performance places. And I don't mind. They're thinking of, of, of our stuff as something that can help them do that. That's fine. It's still benefiting me and in the, in the business. So if I can help them get better at that gym and then their sport, I'm fine with that because I know I'm helping this person in the long run. So the referrals with the athletes, I think, help uh, or are the easier ones to get than the adult. You know, and if you get the so if you get the best athlete right in school, you get them in your program. Then you can get the worst athlete too, and you can bring you can bring the worst athlete up, and then with the best athlete, you know, it's harder to make bigger gains. But because yeah. they see the best athlete in there, they're like, oh, it's a good program. And if you can take the the kid that you know may have not been the best and really bring him up, that's huge too. It's, it's, it's really huge. And then you also get everything in the middle. Cause then you have the, the one kid who's the best athlete. He has his, you know, his friend group of other, I'm sure like really good athletes. And you have the kid who's not as good of an athlete, but like wants to get better and is a really hard worker. And then he has his friends who are the same kind of way, but maybe they're not, you know, quite friendly with the really talented kids. Now you're getting that middle part. That's kind of like just lost in that mix you know so that's another thing to think about too if you have you know from one school the best athlete and the you know one that's a little bit limited you can get the middle the one thing that going back to the trend what you said about ben patrick the knees over toes guy that is a trend that i am really excited to see coming around it, it's slowly and gradually picking up steam but it's taken quite a while but yeah, yeah. definitely it's a, that's a good one yeah because people have been talking about it forever I mean, for a long time in our industry, but he's he's done the best job of really bringing it to the forefront and and making it making it cool, making it and it has a program that works for people too. 
You know, it, it's funny. It, it, go, it goes back to a lot of other things, but I think social media helped that out. If you know all the uh, the, the coaches that were preaching that, you know, years ago, 10, 20, 30 years ago, if they had Instagram, you can in a wider variety of people can see the benefits and maybe would have gotten picked up a little bit sooner. And the trend would have gotten rolling uh, a lot faster, but but I, I agree. I mean, he's 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 doing a really good job. I I remember like two or three, maybe four years ago, like seeing that Instagram page. And I mean, obviously, he's got uh, so many followers now. But I remember it being very very small. It, 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 you know, you got to start somewhere. I remember it being like two or three thousand. But I remember thinking it was cool back then. Like I remember, like oh, this is different. Like this is. This is cool. And I followed him like years ago. And then now having, you know, in the six figures, it's pretty incredible. And it, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's, it's awesome to see. His delivery system is just better. I mean, or, I, or it's more receptive by, by a lot. It's yeah. received much better. And I think it, it's- He had those ailments. He, he had the, the torn ACL, the meniscus problems. He had it. I think people relate to that. Or I know people relate to that. Yeah, because they want to see so it's much more effective when it comes from somebody who's dealt with a lot of injuries and still been able to overcome those. And, and by no means does he say it's easy, which I think is the other thing too, is because people that have those skills and haven't had to deal with those obstacles, it's easy. You know, but when with someone like Ben, he's like, Look, this is work. You're gonna have to put your work in. And you in order to get these to the point where I where I got to. So he's, he's not telling people, look, this is going to be a, a cakewalk. Like it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. Right. I think people, you know, obviously they want to see the instant gratification. They see him and you know, but some, like a lot of people have different timetables, you know, and different timelines. And, you know, some people are going to progress from it faster than others. And that's, that's fine. You know, we have a sign at the gym. It's a uh, seven rules of life. And one of them is don't compare. No, oh, it's great. You know? Great. You yourself to anybody else everyone's different in their own right that is one of our biggest issues especially in training is everybody wants to compare their themselves to everybody else you're like you're you you just keep being you yeah right i know it's hard i know because no matter how much you try to not compare yourself to somebody else there's still that little you know there's that ego that you know it's hard to to resist it but and i get it but and and, I, and i'm a culprit of it myself, you know, like I, I can't help. It's just a competitive part of me that, you know, I see something else that somebody else does, or I see a, you know, another coach that has a little bit more followers or a little bit more, you know, this, that, and the other thing. I'm like, oh, you know, I, I gotta, gotta compete a little bit harder, but it's yeah. Like the, the comparing aspect is, is, is challenging, especially when in, in mobility, you know, cause you see somebody else that can do something, if you can't do, I guarantee your next mobility session that you do for yourself, you're going to try it and it's going to be less beneficial for you than, than if you just stuck to your path and did it at your own speed and then got into there eventually. And then there always comes into question how much, you know, are we, do you necessarily need that maximal limit of mobility versus what do you need for your life? Yeah. And in your concept. That, I, I think that's a big thing. I think that's huge, right? Knowing what is best for you, right? Knowing what you need, like you said, and then working within that circle. And that's a, a big thing that some people might miss too. And that's a really good point. Uh, and something that I haven't thought about. And uh, I think needs to be put a little more to the forefront there. Like know, know what you need and then work from there. It's a really good point. And then the time that it takes, right? So maybe maybe all of us can get to the splits one day, but the time that it would take for us to get there would be would outweigh, you know, all the other training that we'd have to do, everything else I want to do in life. That mm-hmm. is, who get who cares? Like I don't care <laughs> if I can't do this. Right. It, doesn't really, it doesn't help me in everything I need to do. And I think that's where I'm at with pistol squats. And extra time on it. Yeah, I, I think that's where I'm at with pistol squats. You know, like people want to, you know. Like, I want to do a pistol squat. My first, my always, my first question to them when someone says, I want to do a pistol squat. Why? How is that going to bring you satisfaction, like internal satisfaction to do a pistol squat? Like, why else would you need, if you drop your pencil, are you going to go into a pistol squat? <laughs> like, oh, that's what I do all the time. I got my pencil. Now I got a pistol squat for it. I can't do it any other way. Yeah. Like, 
you know, so I, is, is it cool? Yes. Is it impressive? Absolutely. But I'm 30 years old, going to be 31 in two months. Like a pistol squat is, is not my bucket list to, to do. So, you know, more power to people that do it. But for me, I'm, I'm not going to work on doing that. So, you know, I'm not going to waste my time trying to do that when I can. There's a m- bunch of other things that I need to do for myself. Well, I'll tell you what, man. So I, I can do pistols, but I found more benefit doing other types of squats than actually training pistols. So I don't even, I don't even train pistols at all anymore. Mm-hmm. It's just not, I don't, I don't, I don't find them to be better than, you know, um, other, other sorts of single leg squats. Right. I mean, like if, if I'm going to do a single leg squat, I'm going to do an eccentric to a box. I love doing that to that point or TRX single leg squat supported, you know, that, that's like one of the single leg squat variations that we do a lot. Like you said, there's no way. Like, yeah. Bet. So you're not, you're not missing out. <laughs> yeah. No, thanks, Neil. <laughs> well, yeah, we've talked about, you know, even in the, in the squatting world, how many times outside of the gym, when you squat to pick something up, I mean, a lot of times you have your toes in somewhat extension on at least one of the feet, right? I mean, yeah. when we've talked about how you would actually transfer that out into real life so yeah so if that's the case then should we be practicing more you know kickstands kickstand squats you know split squats because that's going to transfer way more to our daily life than a pistol squat yeah right now even i would even argue that for performance purposes you know athletics i would say that heels elevated squats carry over more to flat footed squats. Right. Now you said the, the heel, uh, heel elevated because we also, are you talking about, I'm drawing a blank right now. Yeah, like, on a, like on a, on a platform or something like that. Right. Right. Yeah. You're, you're, or, 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 I mean, if you're, if you're strong enough, man, you yeah. can float them. You can float them. Yeah. 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 I mean, why wouldn't we? Cause I mean, we had that in our, uh, our drum mobilizations, right? right? Left foot, right foot, both, both heels up. And then we lift the stick, work on the ankle stability, that big toe extension, try and maintain it. So, you know, we, we, we work on it. So why not? Why wouldn't we load it? So, you know, I, I've done that a couple of times with only basketball players, mm. uh, but only a handful of times. Like, I, I, I honestly, like four, maybe four times is the amount of times I've had someone do some squats with the heels floating. Because I love cyclist squats. <clears throat> Both those squats are great. Yeah. With the heels up on a... On a- a slant board, and then mm-hmm. all of a sudden you should get to the point, hopefully, where you're like, "Go board, take it away." Let's do the same things, yeah. you know, same exact cyclist squats. So yeah, it, it, because when we look at taking off and locomotion in and in athletic stance, that's what you're you're driving. You're gonna you're gonna go into that position anyway. So you might as well get acclimated in the gym for it instead of waiting until you get out on the field to play for it. Well, thanks, brother, for coming on, man. I know your schedule is tight, so we don't want to take up too much of your time, but it's always great to see you and chat with you, man. Guys, I appreciate it. I, I still can't believe it was a year, so we'll do this again. 2022. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Hopefully, we'll see each other in person. Uh, next time I'm in uh, San Jose, me and you, Dennis, we're having that macaroni contest, that macaroni and cheese contest. Don't think I forgot. Oh man! Um, I don't know, man. You're gonna, you're gonna have to change your your pasta choice, though. <laughs> I got, I got no man. I'll tell you, dude. I, I, anyone that thinks they can make a better macaroni and cheese than me, come, come at. Post your shit on Instagram, social media. Let's see what it is. And uh, yeah, we'll have to compare. Yeah, well, you, yeah, okay. Let's do this. This this week, let's throw on our Facebook or Instagram our macaroni recipe. I like that. Yeah, yeah. I like so that. I'll, I'll go get my supplies, and then we'll uh, we'll see, we'll look and see what the end product looks like. I'm in. Let's do it. All right, sounds good, brother. <laughs> nice, nice. All right, brother. Well, then uh, we'll be in touch. Yeah, hopefully we see you soon, man. Fingers yeah. crossed. Yeah, hopefully. So, and thank you for all the listeners out there. And uh, until next time, be good to each other. <laughs>